Today, uh, a wonderful guest that I'm really excited to have uh, with us, uh, and his name is Tom Scott, ONZM, a cartoonist, of course. I mean, I don't think there's a New Zealander who doesn't know the name Tom Scott. Uh, he's also a brilliant writer and director. He's had a couple of movies. He's been involved in so many projects over the years. Uh, he helped uh, turn Foot Rot Flats into a hit movie. Uh, he upset... Rob Muldoon, as we all know, uh, he's, uh, he was a close friend of Sir Edmund Hillary's and uh, produced that beautiful uh, series, television series, uh, about uh, his life. It was a very poignant watch, actually. And he's going to be taking a bit of a, a, bit of a new direction in the next wee while, and Tom will tell us about that shortly, uh, because he's our special guest for this Hi, Ken. Good afternoon, Leon. How are you? <laughs> good afternoon. That's good. I'm, I'm well, thanks. And how are you? I'm good. I've just had my session with my personal trainer. Very good. Very good. Oh, I didn't so know I, you did that. Well, I did because I've, I'm middle-aged and fat, or old and fat, so I have to do things, things. But my core, my core strength is apparently is on the up, which is good. It's funny because I've just started doing that too, and uh, I think good for you. And you know. You, it, it does make a difference, but you have to you have to persevere, don't you? You do, you do, because the you know the sand through the hourglass is ticking and ticking all the way. <laughs> oh, so it's terrible, isn't it? I want to I want to make a beautiful corpse. I want my undertaker when he comes to put formaldehyde into my body to to be so mildly aroused. So it'd be quite make me feel good. <laughs> yeah. mm. That would be inappropriate, but kind of yeah. funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I love it. Yeah. Tom, oh, it's so great that you could spend some time today and, you know, you've given us some, some really beautiful songs, but I, I guess I, I, I want to uh, talk to you, but before we go kind of way back in time, can we talk about the future a wee bit? Because you've got some quite exciting plans coming up. I have, actually. Uh, years and years ago when my mate John Clark moved to Melbourne, he kept telling me to come over and he said, you've got to come to Australia, it's much more opportunities in Australia and John of course went on to be a superstar in Australia he kept telling me to come over and I resisted and resisted but now I'm being dragged over by a process of solvent drag my partner Abel is the financial controller on a huge big new television series the biggest one ever made in Australia has been shot and doctrines in Melbourne and she's going to be working on it for for two years and I'm going to go with her as her Duke of Edinburgh I'll walk behind her with carrying the loose change Aww. And she ever was a financial controller on Avatar and Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. So she's high and then the, the, the Rings of Power. So she's a highly qualified film account and she's the brains in the family. So I'm going to tag along with her. So I'm going to be an, an Australian resident for the next two, three years. Yeah, Incredible. And Melbourne's such yeah. a great city too. It's a wonderful city. It's a lovely city. Yeah, it's very handsome. It's got fantastic parks. No matter where you live in, in Melbourne, you've only a, a three-minute walk from a good park and a good playground and good swings for the kids. It's, it's been very well thought out. You know, it's, it's quite the, the founding fathers were quite smart. Well, founding mothers and fathers were quite smart. Yeah. So tell me, will you miss Wellington? I always well, I miss that rugged south coast. So my favourite trip in the world is to drive right around the south coast of Wellington, watching the waves crash on the shore. And I, I do miss Wellington, but I, 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 don't, I don't miss the wind, but I do miss the... You're close to nature, you know, you know who's boss in Wellington. Nature's boss, and I like that. I right. like waking up seeing mountains and hills. Yeah, because, I mean, you've, you know, you're, you're synonymous with, with the capital city and even right back to your days when you were swanning about with your platform shoes and your flowing locks of red hair and, you know, you're in the press gallery. What are the, what are the great memories? Well, you did, didn't you? You, you did. Don't bring, don't bring up the hair. That's a cruel thing to do. God, good mighty. <laughs> yeah, yes, it I was did. great. Yes, I looked like an extra out of um, a Scottish movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, lovely red locks. They were all gone. Yeah, but I, you're, no, you're still a dashing it. chap, Tom. Don't worry about that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You, you. you need cataract surgery, but it's all right. I'll take it. Yeah. Yeah, my eyesight's not so good these days. No, Tom, seriously. But, but, but I mean, that's the memory I have of you is you, oh, you had this flamboyance and you added something to that press gallery in the 70s. And, and I, I wanted to kind of remember a bit of that with you. Like, what, what's your enduring memory of, of that time, particularly when you started oh. upsetting people? Well, quite possibly because of recent circumstances, my most vivid memory at the moment is Norm Kirk's body lying in state in the foyer in the, in the coffin. 
and all the MPs walking around the nose. I was standing there. I stood there for two days in the foyer just as the MPs filed past. And I remember Labour MPs going past and they were plotting the succession. They were discussing amongst themselves who would take over as Prime Minister. And I remember Bob Tizard whispering to someone, we've got the numbers, we've got the numbers. And he was delighted that um, Hugh Watt wasn't going, to get, wasn't going to become the leader of the Labour Party. It was going to be Bill Rowling. And I thought, even though Norm Kirk is dead and he's still plotting his succession, they were sort of nakedly ambitious. And I remember Keith Holyoke wandered along and he paused in his morning suit and said, farewell, Norm, farewell. And he had tears in his eyes. And I thought, Norm, Keith Holyoke is, is, more, is grieving more than, than the Labour MPs. It was just an insight into politics that... Mm. Ambition never dies. Politicians die, but ambition keeps going. Yeah, I, I I agree. And you know, Norm's death was rocked New Zealand, didn't it? Very much. Well, it was. And people people they said it gets thirty hour wait to see the Queen's coffin. People stood outside Parliament for days. It was raining, and there were people were queuing. I went down in the went down at four in the morning one morning, and talked to people who were standing outside Parliament. And I said, "Why are you here?" And I driven down from Wangarei with his kids. He said. A lot of my children just to pay their tributes to a great man. And there was a huge amount of grieving for Norm. And then six months later, it's almost like he never existed. There's such an outpouring of grief there, so people could have sort of expended it. Mm. And, um, uh, and the Labour Party, I said to Bill Rowling, I said, call a snap election, you'll, you'll piss him, you'll piss him. <laughs> Did you, are those the said, words you used? Yeah, the I said, do it right now. There's such a huge amount of grieving for Norm. Take advantage of it. Mm. He said, no, I wouldn't be so, I wouldn't be so cheap and manipulative. Said him. And I said, well, you know, you, you've got to do it. If Labour had called the snap election after Norm's death, I would have been re-elected, you know, with the same majority. And our New Zealand's history would, would be quite different. We would have had a, a superannuation scheme that Roger Douglas dreamed up. We wouldn't have had to sell the railways in New Zealand and BNZ. We would be a, we'd be a wealthier country today if, if they'd taken my advice. But, no one listens to me, Leanne, no one. <laughs> Your message was like, nice guys finish last, get in there, sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they take advantage of the grief and, and you know, be a bit more cunning, but Bill Rowling wasn't, he wasn't a schemer like that. No, he wasn't, was he? No, he, he was, no. seemed quite soft, quite gentle. He was, he was a good man, but he, he wasn't as cunning as more. And then on the campaign trail of that particular election, uh, after um, Norm's widow lived in Motorua, and the red party on the campaign trail, Bill Rowley didn't go and pay her a visit, but Muldoon did with the camera crew. So Muldoon knew if there's going to be any, anything that could be, anything could be squeezed out of the Norm Kirk sponge, she was going to do it. So he was filmed visiting Norm's widow, but the Labour Party didn't do it, or they weren't filmed doing it. So mm. um, uh, Muldoon was a much more cunning politician than, than Bill Rowling. Yeah, for sure. Hey, well, I think we should take your first song because we're here to talk music as well. And it's kind of a good one to start with because that was kind of a day in the life. And you've chosen the Beatles. Uh, I guess uh, it's pretty obvious why you chose the song. Well, it's a masterpiece of a song. It's just absolutely phenomenal. I love John's voice. And I like the, uh, there's a little bit of journalism in there too. He's describing the death of a journalist. I think it was a journalist who committed suicide in the car. And it's just a lovely song, beautiful song. It's just fantastic. Mm. Yeah, there's, there were lots of amazing things in that song. I love the line that John Lennon had wanted to get from uh, Holes in Blackburn, Lancashire to the Albert Hall. And he said to Ringo, I'm stuck. What do I do with these holes? <laughs> yeah. How do I get from the holes to the Albert Hall? And Ringo said, Phil, how many holes does it take to fill? So the idea that you can take a space and use it to fill a bigger space was such a lovely, 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 lovely Oh, there they go. Yes. And and that, mm. of course, is part of the song. And that's yes. typical of the Beatles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Isn't, it? Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. No, and that, the Beatles increased the alphabet. I mean, when the Beatles first arrived, the alphabet had half the letters it does have now. And they just increased the the techniques and, uh, and you know production things you could use. And the, that inspired, I don't think there'd be a Pink Floyd without without the day in the life. You know, they, they, right. they just sort of, they just increased the possibilities of what rock music could do. I think that's a really good point, actually. Tom, obviously music's like a, a huge part of you and, and w your son, Sam, the frontman of Phoenix Foundation, and we're going to be playing one of his songs later. It's a, a, a real beauty to I, I love this one uh, you've chosen. But I wanted to ask you, in terms of like, y you know, your, your comedy and your humour and and your cartooning skills, where do you think you got that from? Like, I mean, you've written books about both of your parents, but where did it come from, this humour and this, this satire? 
for you? I, well, my heroes growing up were, were, were the Goon Show, Spike Milligan. I thought Spike Milligan was an absolute genius, and the Goon Show, I love the Goon Show. We used to te- used to be on Radio New Zealand a lot, and we used to, we was on, it was on too late at night, we were sent to bed, but I'd get out of bed and sneak into the hall and lie down on the floor where I put my head just under the door jam, and I could hear the Goon Show being played on the radio in the, in the other room and then my laughter would give me away and my father would open the door and say go back to bed go back to bed but I'd go back to bed then I'd sneak back come back and listen to the goon show and <laughs> yeah. the surreal humour and the goons Peter Sellers Spike Mulligan Harry Seacombe they were my first comedy heroes and then I devoured everything from, you know, from uh, Hancock's Half Hour and Peter Cook and Dudley Moore all the British comics Monty Python but also Spike Mulligan's writing was fantastic oh wasn't there's it there's a, there's a there's a book called Pacoon. Have you read Pacoon? I th- I don't know, but I love. I know what you mean about Spike. He's a great writer. Yeah, and he, he lines like he stood to one side, which was all he was numerically capable of. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, it's, it's a great. It's a joke out of nothing, isn't it? And uh, yeah. the, his poetry is fantastic. You know, um, Carrington Briggs cared not two figs whether he lived or died, but when he was dead, he sat on his bed and he cried and he cried and he cried. <laughs> I think that's. that's it's delightful. Isn't it? all, yeah, I used to read them to my kids. They loved. They all grew up in you know, Bad Jelly the Witch. They all grew up on Spike Milligan as well because he's an absolute comic genius, and he was my main influence. And as I got older, I, I, I picked up Woody Allen and people like that as well. But was, Spike Milligan is my hero, total hero. Yeah, and that absurdity in his writing too uh, mm. is probably attractive to mm. you because. You you have a dark you ha- you have quite a d- you know you're happy to to delve into a bit of dark humour aren't you and a bit of uh, almost gallows humour. Yeah, well I like it all. I like it all. Yeah. Well, the ins- well, there's dark the darkness in the goons as well. It was basically one huge scream of pain against World War Two. You I know, mean, most of it is about about World War Two and 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 how stupid and absurd war is. And Spike Milligan was just heightened the absurdity, and th- that all appealed to me as well. Mm, mm. Uh, wonderful writing, and actually just makes me want to just go back and 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 seek it all out again. I have to ask you: Were you? Did you go through that hippie phase in the sixties and seventies? No, not really. I was never never into that sort of stuff much. I was. I'm a very safe guy. I mean, I, I mean, I was flattered with the guys at university who dropped acid, but they 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 couldn't get hold of any acid. They went all around Palmerston North buying morning glory seeds and trying to eat morning glory seeds and yeah. and uh, but I never did any of that. I was my father was an alcoholic and I didn't like seeing him out of control, so I never wanted to lose control. Right. So I wouldn't dare to. I wouldn't dare take any. I would. I would never. I've never snorted cocaine. I've never taken LSD because I, I. I thought I would. I would. I would remain mad. I wouldn't come out of it. I. Mm. You know, it would tip me over, and I'd be permanently damaged and, mm. and buggered. So my brain is in good, good working order. Yeah, which is I, which um, is great, isn't it? I, yeah, I've looked after it. Yeah. Yeah, and so the reason I asked that was because you've chosen Jimi Hendrix, and I, I, I just thought, you know, I mean, we lost Jimmy. He was one of the Twenty Seven Club, wasn't he? Was he 27? Yeah. Yes, he, he, but he died. But he got drunk and inhaled his own vomit. Mm. You know, I think she, Janis Joplin died the same way. She died on a, she choked on a sandwich. I thought but, it was heroin uh, with I, Janis. Yeah. Well, I thought you choked on a sandwich. I, I, I'm it was Mama Cass. Don't correct me in public, <laughs> Leanne. How dare you? <laughs> people don't dare <laughs> idolise me, and now you've, you've, you've done yourself a lot of damage, and people are wondering why you're picking on that poor middle-aged man. Well, I used to draw Jimi Hendrix. One of my, I was you know, obviously quite good at art, and I used to draw big murals of Hendrix and Lightning Hopkins and people like that, and lead belly on the walls of student flats. So there were still lead murals of mine on flats in Palmerston North. And Jimmy was one guy I loved drawing. He had a beautiful face. He's oh, very, didn't he? You know, he's amazing, amazing man. Yeah, and I love his version of the Bob Dylan song. The Bob Dylan song, the original on John Wesley Harding, is fantastic in its own right, mm. but it's acoustic and it's it's still and it's got lovely lines. So outside in the distance, two two riders were approaching, and the wind began to howl. And you just takes you you just you can see it in your own head. You can see this bleak landscape and two riders, a bit like the country around you are, except in winter. You can you can you should relate to that line. Oh, totally, very much. And mm. and when you read that out now, uh, you can just see why the song's so powerful. So I reckon we better roll a bit of Jimmy right now. This is Tom's second choice, all along the Watchtower. Yeah, wonderful choice, uh, Tom Scott. And you can imagine Jimmy in his velvet jacket and his scarves flowing. Yeah, can you? 
he was sick, sexy man, yeah. yeah. And you, can you, you, you play the guitar? Could you play that? No way. <laughs> no. <laughs> I play the but guitar. But what about roughly. your son, Joel? Can Joel play it? Yeah. Well, Joel's a great drummer and he's a DJ, so he's got into kind of all that drum and bass side of things. Uh, so he, uh, yeah. Yeah. So he's definitely musical, but. Um, but no, to to can you play that? Okay, can no, you? I don't. My, bro, I, my my both my brothers are musos, or and they're, they're very talented. But I, I I don't have a musical bone in my body. But I was going to say before that my favourite guitarists are Hendrix, John McLaughlin, and Jeff Beck. And Jeff Beck does a wonderful version of Down the Life. If you want to check out Jeff Beck's version of Down the Life, he he plays it on on guitar. It's absolutely stunning. It's okay, worth, worth, worth a listen. Yeah, worth I, have, a listen. I haven't heard that. Was that? song that we just played was that in the movie with nail and i possibly yeah possibly it's been been used quite a lot yeah mm. it's so dramatic and so powerful it's so powerful yeah mm, i can see why you chose it you know it's mm. it's funny because you talk a lot about being in your in your autumn years but you're not you're not that old really are you tom you're only in your 70s <laughs> 75 <laughs> yeah well i think i turned seven i turned 76 in a few weeks do you it makes me pretty yeah 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 but you, 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 with the back lit and the right, you know, bit of um, dry ice, you know, I could pass for a man half my age. No, of, of course you can, and it's very cool that you that you're um, you're splitting off to to Melbourne for for a different life. Do you think, like, are you going to continue uh, writing drama and um, and working over there? Yep. What, are, what are your plans? Yes, yes, I am. Well, I'm hoping to get a couple of play. My play, The Daylight Atheist, was put on by the Melbourne Theatre Company and was a big hit in Australia. And then I went to Melbourne and Sydney and Adelaide and Brisbane and Perth. So it did very well. It was quite a successful play in Australia. So I'm hoping... I wrote a play about my, about my mother called Joan, and I'm hoping that... Um, that it will get put on, it'll get picked up by an Australian theatre company and put on in Australia as well. Yeah. Well, it's good because you're in a very cultural city, aren't you? So I imagine the, you know, yeah. be a lot of interest in your work there. Yeah, well, I'm hoping so. And also, it, I think it's a reasonably amusing play, and it's a universe. Everyone has a mother, so mm. you know, you can everyone can relate to the story. You were you were really close to your mother, weren't you? Well, I was much closer to her than I was to my father. You know, my, my father and I didn't get on very well, which is, uh, but he was damaged by the war. He, that, he was that generation of men. They they saw things and had to do things which we've been spared. So you have to forgive them. They, you know, they saved the world from a, a great evil, and you you've got to forgive them. And so I, I have forgiven him, but he wasn't. He only ever called me one name all my life. He only ever called me Egghead. Yeah, and, dreadful, uh, isn't just, it? Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. But look at me now. He was right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, he was. You know, Pippa gig. Yeah. <laughs> do Do you think? Do you think the way that he treated you and his distance and things, you know, just drove you further and further towards bo being more successful? As you yes, it did. It gave me a great drive to, 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 I had to impress somebody. If I couldn't impress him, I was going to impress other people. So, And I was, I was very good at art. I was able to draw really well quite quickly. It, when I turned up at primary school in Rongatia Primary School, the teacher ran from the room and put the headmaster back. And they all, all the teachers gathered around me and I didn't speak to primary school. I had my own box of chalks under my desk. I'm so old, we used to have desks. The lid would lift up those desks. Yeah, those, those ones. Lift, and I had a box of chalks, and then they'd teachers would come and borrow me. Say, can we borrow Tommy? And I'd march off behind the other team. They'd go into another classroom. They'd say, can you draw a Spanish galleon or a fortified married pa? And I'd draw the drawing on the blackboard, and teachers would gather around and go, oh, my God, look at him. He's so clever. He's so clever. Isn't that so great? That, 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 that a lot of damage. I became an egomaniac from a very early age. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but but it's great that they actually appreciated your talent because in a lot a lot of uh, previous stories from from other people, uh, they recount how teachers completely knocked their self esteem and uh, told them they had no, no talent. Well, my um, I hope I'm allowed to swear on radio. My mother went to a parent teachers meeting in Fielding Ag in the sixth form. Mm. She went up to my English teacher and said, "I'm Tommy Scott's mother," and he said. Your son is an idiot. He'll never amount to anything. And, and mum told me this story. They said, oh, mum, what did you say? Mum said, I got, don't worry, darling. I got back in and quick as a flash. I said to him, don't think your shit doesn't stink, Sonny Jim. <laughs> and that's what mum said to my teacher. <laughs> don't think your shit doesn't stink. And I, no one, I bet no other mother has ever said that to a teacher at a parent-teacher meeting. But I tell you what, 
he treated me with much more respect after that. He didn't want another visit from mum. <laughs> good, good on her for actually standing up yeah, exactly, to him. Exactly. Good yeah, on her. Exactly, yeah. In Egypt, yeah. and what did he base this claim on, that you were in Egypt? I was in... I, I cracked jokes. I was, a, I, you know, I was a bit of a class clown, and I liked making other kids laugh. And, um, you know, and teachers don't like that. They don't like kids laughing, especially if they don't know what, what's caused it. Plus, when, whenever teachers left the room, I would dash up to the blackboard and do a caricature of them and <laughs> draw them on the blackboard. And so I was, I was a pain in the ass, basically, to the teachers, and I, I don't blame them for getting annoyed with me. Yeah. <laughs> I bet you did really good caricatures, too, of the teachers, like really mean ones to exacerbate their... Yeah, yeah, I'd, you know, yeah, they're, they're bad pretty, points. Was, yeah, it was pretty good. If they were ugly, they were, they were, they were fair game, you know. There was, I was mean, probably. Yeah, never mind. Yeah. yeah, but, hey, you know, it's funny in New Zealand. We don't we don't laugh enough, do we, Tom? Do you think? In this country? You can't laugh, you, you can't laugh too much. It's good for you. It releases dopamine. Uh, I mean, laughter releases the same hormones as a sexual orgasm. That's right. So it's a, it's, it's a poor man's orgasm, really. So, um, yeah, do so if more. you make a girl laugh, you bought... You, you, you're halfway there. Really. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. Some of the um, uh, least attractive men in the world um, uh, who are comedians have pulled the, some of the most gorgeous women. Uh, and, mm. uh, yeah, you know, it, it's it's a gift if you can if you can bring laughter. So we're talking music, uh, Stuart Island Disc with the great Tom Scott. And the next song you've chosen is Procol Harum, which everyone will know. Why is this so significant to you? <laughs> It, I think it, so someone asked Ringo Starr once what the best song of the 60s was, and he said, what summed up the 60s more than any other song? This is the drum with the Beatles, and he said, white a shade of pale. And it's true, it is, and there's great lines in it, 16 best virgins are leaving for the coast. Yes. It's so evocative. It's just so evocative. And the, it, it's got a bit of bark, I think it's bark. The, the organ piece at the beginning is a bit of cod bark, and it's just... The song is so mysterious. You, you, no one, you, you never know what it, quite what, it, what it's saying, but it's, it's so ethereal and, and mysterious, and I just loved it. It's beautiful, and, uh, isn't you know, it? I, mm. I never tire of it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it still holds its own. Well, let's hear Whiter Shade yeah. of Pale. It's, yeah, it's, it's great, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you, I still don't know what it's about. Joe Cocker does a brilliant version of it, too. I was looking up, you know, the meaning of it, and it's really hard to find any straight, you know, any honest description of how, you know, how the words came mm. about, you know. Um, and, and it does sound, uh, I mean, certainly the first reference sounds like a bit of a drug trip because he was saying uh, as the, he was feeling seasick she, and, and the yeah, ceiling and the flew ceiling away. Flew, <laughs> flew away, yeah. That's it, that sounds like a drug trip, not that I've ever had one. But the, it's the idea of Bristol Virgins leaving for the coast does it for me. <laughs> like, go, bring, them, bring them back here. Don't take them away. Don't take them away. <laughs> bring them it's, back to the mainland. <laughs> bring them back. Bring them back. They're heading for Stuart Island, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> heading for Stuart Island Discs. Yeah, pretty mm. fun. Uh, no, it's a, it's a very moving and beautiful song, and you can't, <laughs> you can't uh, credit that songwriting enough. And, yeah, it's just mm. terrific. What a song. I see why you chose it. So... For you, so so certainly the fire's still in your belly, Tom, isn't it? Like uh, there, there's there's more that you want to do. You seem to be constant. You don't ever seem to be out of ideas. Is that fair to say? Well, I'm the ugliest thing on planet Earth. I'm an old man in a hurry. You know, I, there's still things I want miles to go. I want to do things. I've more things I want to do and want to say. I just hope I don't run out of an audience. That's a, I haven't run out of an ideas. I might run out of an audience. That might be the, that might slow me down a bit. No, I've got other TV films and plays and movies I want to make, yeah. Mm. I really enjoyed your Separation yeah. City. I thought that was great in 2009. Yeah, that was, um, yeah, that, that, that's a good film. Richard People came up to me once and said that was his favourite New Zealand film. Or well, Richard People's wife, sorry, I'm getting it wrong. His it's wife a good film. Came up to me. She said, oh, that's a good film. Peter Jackson wrote me a fan letter. I was so chuffed. It's a fact, I've blown it up. You walk into my house, now all you can see when you walk in the door is this huge blown up fan letter from Peter Jackson saying, he said, this is the kind of movie we should be making. He said, I love your, I love the comedy and your, 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 your writing of dialogue. So I was, I was pretty chuffed to get a fan letter from Peter Jackson. It's pretty cool. That is very cool. And, but I mean, you are, you've, you've got a touch and I think, um, I think that relationship uh, issue, perhaps we don't have enough of these, these type of films and also with, with, with that undercurrent of humour, but also, in, you know, introspection, like you're looking at yeah, why things work and why they don't. I don't know. I just, I, I really enjoyed it. Plus, yeah. great cast too. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I wanted to write a modern comedy that, that was about 
New Zealand as it is now and about how people behave. And a lot of our movies are, are so dark to pull up that murders and uh, um, colonial violence. And, oh, dreadfully dark. You know, yeah, and, and some, you know, uh, once were warriors. I, I watched once were warriors through my fingers. I couldn't, it was awful to watch. It was a, it was a terrifically well-made film, but it's hardly a pleasant experience. Not a, not a date movie, is it? You couldn't take any no. once were warriors. <laughs> no. Yeah. no, it was, it was, yeah. it was harrowing, I think. It's the best yeah, thing. And, it, yeah, and Separation City, I, I got Mike Minogue in that, and He's gone on to be, you know, what we do in the shadows and various other things. He's, he's a very, he was, he was fantastic in that. The German actor Thomas Kretschmann said to me, Thomas Kretschmann was in it. He was in, you know, the Dust Boat and lots of other famous films and uh, he's a very successful actor. And there was Joel, Joel, the other guy, the other Joel, the other famous Joel, Joel Edgerton. And Thomas Kretschmann said to me, "Hey, Tommy, Tommy, Tommy," he said, and he, he said, uh, "Joel and I are famous film stars, but." We're not as good as that Mike Minogue. He's better than any of us. He's a fantastic, fantastic oh, actor. Okay. And, and, mm. It's so great. I, was, I, was, I, was I, feel, I feel like I discovered Mike Minogue, or my, my partner, Apple, suggested him to me. Yes. He's, he's a lovely guy, yeah. Yeah, he's clever. Oh, it's great. I mean, you, you, would, you encountered, you've worked with, uh, you know, so many people. And, you know, it's funny because it's like, for me, there's loads of nostalgia talking to you because I, I remember the McPhail and Gadsby days and I remember, yeah. um, you know, that period of time when New Zealand, I don't know, I don't know if, it's, if I'm looking at it with rose-tinted glasses, but I just wonder, what do you think about the state of our country as you prepare to uh, leap over to Melbourne? Are we in good shape? We're too politically correct. We're... Yeah, it's just become, and the, the cancel culture's got 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 a bit alarming around here. We we could do with Billy T. Day, Billy T. J. and John Clark now, and A. K. Grant. Oh yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. I mean, there were some. Alan Grant, I think, was a great unacknowledged New Zealand comic genius. He was a fantastically funny writer, and John was absolutely brilliant, and uh, and so was Billy T. I don't know if Billy T. would be allowed. He was. He got into enough trouble as it was. He probably would be wouldn't be allowed to be put on TV now. He was, but he was great. Yeah. Yeah, but so he was unifi- he was unifying. I reckon. You know, like that's what annoys me. You're right about that. Is it's like <laughs> uh, he wasn't racist. I don't believe. I mean, no. if anyone's listening and no. thinks that, they can text him. But he wasn't. But he he was. I mean, yeah. We. Hmm, I don't know. It's it's just I mi- I miss that too. But as I say, I just wonder whether. Uh, yeah, we don't seem terribly free, and it, it strikes me as odd that here we are at the bottom of the world, this you know, sort of lovely island little, you know, nation, and um, we seem all bound up and uptight and and, uh, and well, mis- we, miserable. We, <laughs> but, but, but we do have brilliant people. Look at uh, Taika Waititi. I mean, he's a brilliantly funny man, and what we do in the shadows is a very funny show. We are. There is a lot of talent here, but a lot of us working overseas now, which is which is a shame. Um, yes, that's but, right. But Tiger's absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Uh, we we and and that's true. We 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 are producing great people, and and we and there is a lot of creativity here. You'll be missed, and you'll be missed in uh, in in Welly. Will you? Do you plan to like if it if it goes well? Will you will you stay longer over in Australia, or what do you think? If they make me governor general, I'll stay. <laughs> but I don't know. I I. Um, no, I love New Zealand. I, I, I'm a Kiwi up through and through. I migrated here as a baby, you know, as a, as a kid. So I, I sort of feel like I, I, New Zealand's been good to me, and I, I could never become a citizen in, a, in, a, in another country. New Zealand is too important to me. So, what's the word to Ranga Waiwai? That lovely Maori word, a place to stand. Mm, and, yeah. and and Wellington is my Ranga Waiwai. That's where I belong. It's, I belong to the land down there, and the land belongs to me. I, so I will miss it terribly. I, I dream of New Zealand. I get, I'm, I'm one of the few people I know. When the first time I, first couple of times I flew overseas and I came back to New Zealand, when the plane came in flying over into Auckland Airport, I, or, or over the Marlborough Sounds into Wellington, I would find myself crying in the plane. Oh. And I was like, goodness, I was just weeping with joy, so happy to be back in New Zealand because I'm just so proud of this place. I'm very proud of. Um, our race relations. You see, in Australia is now struggling to try and come to terms with its colonial past. We 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 did, we made terrible mistakes as well. But it's lovely to see Tereo coming back, mm. and the, now the, the Wallabies they don't have a haka, but they're putting Aboriginal motifs on their on their jerseys and stuff. And you can see in the 
and the Australian media, they're about 30 years behind us, but they're trying. We've got, we've got a 30-year advance on the Aussies. Yeah, we do. We're not perfect yet. We're not perfect yet, but we do know we made mistakes and we are trying to correct things, which is which has to be commended, really. Totally. Right, we better get into our next song. You've chosen Van Morrison. What a choice, Into the Mystic. Why? Mm. Well, I'm Irish for a start, and oh, I, I just love Van Morrison. I love I love Astral Weeks. It's my favourite album. I play it a lot. And uh, Into the Mystic, has got, again, it's got some of those lovely... open. You can think what you like about what's going on. And um, But... You can sometimes singers can deceive you. On Beat and Fleece, he does a song called Streets of Arklow. I don't know if you know the song. And it's a, I love the song. And when I went to Ireland I, with my twin sister Sue, we drove down and I went to Arklow and I was so disappointed. What a bloody boring drag. It was like Fox. And <laughs> it, it was nowhere near as exciting as the song. As the song. So, <laughs> I love it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he's so just amazing. Was, yeah, Van, isn't mm. he? He's terrific. Yeah. And he's grumpy and fat and got male fat and baldness, you know. I identify with him strongly. Yeah. <laughs> Stop it. Okay, Tom Scott, here is Into the Mystic. It's just exquisite, that song, isn't it, Tom? Isn't it? Yeah, what does We Were Born Before the Wind mean? I know. What a line. It doesn't though. matter, eh? It, no. just, it, just, it just sets off little wee explosions in your brain. It doesn't matter where they are. Oh, you know, you're just, just fantastic, eh? How do you come again, up with that line, you know, for starters? He's Irish. He's Irish. They're, they're, I'm very proud of being Irish. They're wonderful, mystical people, yeah. Yeah, very much. Very and, spiritual. Mm. Yeah, it is very spiritual. You can see why I think there's a link between Tangata Whenua and the, and the Irish. My father, his close friends in Fielding were all Tangata Whenua. You know, he got on well with the Maori, and the Maori, Maori liked him. And I think it's because they have the same spiritual connection. They're both... They're both very spiritual people, so... Yeah, I, th I think that's, uh, that's it. Yeah. No, no, yeah. I, th I think you've hit the nail on, on the head, to use a bad uh, term. Uh, I think we need to... We actually, sadly, we've only got a couple of minutes before we have to play play the last song, so I have to turn now to to your son, Sam, of, of whom I'm sure you're incredibly proud with his, his work in the field of music and, of course, as a frontman of Phoenix Foundation. Um, how, how, is, how is your relationship and, uh, and, and, you know, how proud do you feel when well, you hear his songs? Oh, incredibly proud. And, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'd also, I'm so proud. He's a wonderful dad, a wonderful husband, a wonderful dad. But that's what I'm most proud of. He's a fantastic musician, but he's a better, even better human being. And he's, I've just loved watching him with his kids. And I think, well, I must have done something right. If, he's, if, he, if he used me as a role model, if I can take some of the credit for Sam being such a good dad, I'm very proud of him because he reflects well on me. He's just a lovely, lovely, lovely man and a very talented singer. I was worried sick when he said he was going to become a musician. I thought, good God, he's going to struggle. It's going to be heartache there. But he, he stuck with it. And he's, he's actually making a living as a muso, which is, which is pretty good, really. Pretty tough to do, but he's done it. Yeah, he, it's, a, it's a phenomenal band and you should be proud. And you're right, that's all you can ask for as, as a parent. So I think, uh, I think that's wonderful and you can yeah. hear that, you can hear that in, in, in your words. So, oh, Tom, it's been, it's been just delightful speaking with you. And I know you had one more song, but what, uh, which, which sounded intriguing. But we're going, to have to, um, we're going to have to just play that separately sometime. Maybe when I come back and I'll, I'll just mention it was one of your favourites. But I have lined yeah. up uh, the Phoenix Foundation to go out on. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's a great way to finish, finish the segment. Thanks, Leanne. It's been a pleasure. Thank it's, you. Cheers. It's been wonderful. And all the best in Melbourne, hey? We'll miss you. Yeah. Cheers. Bye. Tom, 